concern in the prison service. And I'm sure you must have been aware, or you would be aware of it, that the immediate past council attempted to sell the prison's headquarters barracks at cantonments, and the entire complex at Roman Ridge and to relocate to a valley in Ketasi under a PPP arrangement. Officers of the service vehemently rejected that. What would you do when this house eventually passes you as Minister for in Interior? What will be your initial, um, what will you do? Let me make it short. What will you do? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am not aware that the prisons, Ghana Prison Service sought to or proposed to sell off its properties in cantonments. What I'm aware of is that in Kumasi, in the center of Kumasi, there's a prison, and there are moves to relocate the prison outside, and that transaction is what I know about. I shall investigate if or when given the nod. And believe me, we would ensure that no one would sell off the property of the state unjustifiably. But for now, let me say I'm not aware and that I'll investigate and the necessary action will be taken to protect the interests of the state. Chairman, if my, I may, uh, on our cabo, just uh, a follow-up. Will you support a relocation exercise of the same service within Accra? Mr. Chairman, th thank you for the question. Every case must be considered on its own merits. If I give a blanket answer, it will be very unscientific. It depends on the proposal. And if the proposal sits well within the program the Ex Excellency has for that, without sacrificing national interest, if indeed it will enhance national interest, it shall be considered and granted according to his merits. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, I'm interested, sorry, I'm interested in your last words. You cannot use if for the Commander in Chief and His Excellency. If you say if in the national interest, the Constitution does not define national interest, the, probably the Interpretation Act, you would not find it properly defined. So if tomorrow you have executive directives to relocate the prisons in Accra, will you conceive that as something pursuant to national interest? I would say, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am of the conviction that is, 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 is ex if an EI or order comes from there, it will be well grounded. I'm convinced that it will be well grounded. Thank you. Um, honorable nominee, I'm sure you are aware of the Justice for All program currently ongoing. And in the midst of the financial difficulties, the prison service has been faced with major challenges in terms of um, how the meager resources are being used and even the feeding for inmates. And I want to find out what you would do to ensure that uh, the prisons are adequately taken care of and inmates and their reform programs are strengthened so that they come out and integrate properly into society. Thank you very much. We have it in the manifesto to decongest the prisons. And it might require the person of legislation to deal with pre-trial detention, to deal with non-custodial sentences, to deal with separation of remand and conviction and convicted and convicts. So yes, 
It is in the manifesto, and right now we have about 13,000 prisoners, and the place is crowded. So yes, we might need that, but in the interim, there is a provision, especially in, in Sawan prison, where a judge goes to sit there and tries to alleviate or ameliorate the situation. We would continue to pursue those, those uh, approaches until honorable members cooperate with us to pass the necessary legislation to enable us revamp the whole system bear in mind that we want people to come out and also have system by which non consider sentences can be saved without going to prison. So Mr. Chairman, I think this is an opportunity to, in advance, appeal to members to, to be expectant and, and, and assist us. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, I'm done. Chairman, I have a little uh, follow-up again. If the honorable nominee would be kind enough Pre-trial detention, there is practice in our national life of conflict that borders on the Constitution and the laws of Ghana, which requires that 48 hours within the period that any person is uh, arrested, the right to a fair trial is an important right. Will you elaborate further what you intend to do in order to reduce the consequence of Ghanaians suffering from unnecessary pre-trial detention exercise by our security agencies, particularly the police. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think that it has been stated clearly that security agencies under His Excellency the President will operate within the law, within the context of the human rights of the suspects. A suspect is a suspect until convicted. And we expect the security services, the police, and all those concerned to professionally do their work. If there's a need to detain somebody with beyond 48 hours, it can only be on the direction of, the, of a court. And we will insist that they respect the law and they respect the rights of suspects until they are convicted. So, Mr. Chairman, I believe that we would pursue that cause and try to reduce, working towards eliminating the abuse of the system. That is why there will be provision to retrain, to train further, to enhance the training of our police to act professionally. Chairman, I have another, using a trot trot driver as my case. There are instances where just a conflict of an exchange of words between a truck truck driver and a police lance the truck truck driver in cells, sometimes beyond 48 hours. Can you assure this house that you will not supervise such uh, inhumane practices as Minister for Interior? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I can assure you that I would not supervise, nor condone that. And in that, I have the full support of His Excellency the President. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, my first question will be on the proposed Narcotics Commission Bill. Um, there's a strong civil society coalition out there that has supported uh, the previous government to put a draft bill together. And they are keen on seeing this bill uh, passed by this house. I want to gauge your level of commitment if you are familiar with the bill and uh, what pledge can you make to this house and to civil society. There's a strong coalition out there, the Africa Group in Vienna, the COAS, and all of them who are really, really looking forward to the passage of this Narcotic Commission bill. Are you familiar with the bill and what is your commitment to this bill? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think this is a very important question. I'm first of all familiar with the commitment in our manifesto to come out with a comprehensive you know, legislation 
to increase penalties and to do all that we can to reduce towards eliminating narcotics. So I know there will be need for legislation. I've also been informed that there is a bill that has not yet been passed. I have not stated the bill. I would do so, but I can assure that if it supports the ideals within the manifesto, you have my commitment, 100%. Uh, Sammy, let me. Uh, Honorable Ambrose Derry, what if it is not within the manifesto, but in the national interest? You premise your concluding words that if it's in the manifesto, I'm sure uh, Mrs. Anokumi is smiling at your back, a uh, civil uh, servant who understands this. The trust was to transform the Narcotics Control Board into a commission in order that it had more independence and more autonomy. Will you support that? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I will support that principle. What the last question was, was premised on my understanding of the bill. Since I have not read it, I'm careful to say, give a blanket, yes. But, you know, empowering the board to become a commission and be more efficient in doing this work, yes. Yes, that, that you have the commitment. Mr. Chairman, my second question has to do with the growing spate of vigilantism uh, in this country. If given the nod, you will be arriving at the Interior Ministry at a time that uh, many Ghanaians are concerned. And uh, this should cut across all political parties. Uh, uh, you see political parties forming uh, groups as though um, they will want to create their own protection outside the security architecture that our constitution allows. And when elections are won, these groups just, you know, maraud and invade and seize and do whatever they want outside the confines of the law. Um, how can you really stamp your authority? And um, it's great that your background really uh, brings some interesting dynamics. You've been uh, chairman of the Nandom Youth and Development Association. You've been a former Attorney General and Minister of Justice, a former Upper West Regional Minister. And so you should understand, you know, the psyche of the youth and why they will lend themselves to this vigilantism and, you know, go about um, doing the things they do. How can you assure this nation that as Minister of the Interior, you will really address this matter and uh, root it out of our body politic once and for all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think the principle is clear that all wrongdoing must be condemned and not be countenanced. However, handling of each complaint must be professionally pursued that you are a suspect, investigation conducted in the context that Honorable uh, Minority Leader was talking about, that the rights are respected, and people who deserve to be prosecuted will be prosecuted. I'm aware that I've got reports from the police already that some prosecutions are ongoing. I'm also happy that you have alluded to political or partisan considerations. Mr. Chairman, crime has no political color, no partisan color. And when we are too partisan, the only beneficiaries are the offenders and the criminals. And what is going to happen is that Ghana is not going to be the safe place for the necessary economic activity resulting in the economic development that we want. And it is also important to let individual citizens know there is no vicarious liability in criminal offenses. That if any group tells you, go and do wrong, and you do, the furthest they will go is accompany you to the court. And when you are convicted, they will look on you in helpless sympathy. Because you would go to serve the, the, the sentence. 
So I appeal to all political parties to deal with offenses dispassionately. Yes, the context must also be put right. Article 41 gives citizens the, the uh, obligation to cooperate with security agencies. It also gives citizens the duties to protect public property and, and what have you. Indeed, when it comes to misuse of funds, it even uses combat. You know, so we need to, in doing things professionally, ask the basis for these things. But I believe we can all take comfort in the fact that with experience, with time, the incidents are reducing. It started at a certain level and it's reducing. That shouldn't make us comfortable because there's only one league and that's the international league. I don't believe in mediocrity where you create a smaller league so that you can be a champion. Maybe you talk about best in West Africa or best in Africa. We must go for best international practices. And therefore, yes, we must work together. But we, the politicians, must give right leadership. We shouldn't give signals that might be misread to mean that it's reduced partisanship, that once one side says A, the other side says B. Indeed, I believe Honorable uh, Deputy, Man uh, Deputy Manotti will remember in the fifth parliament when we were dealing with uh, uh, the drug uh, issues in parliament, there was this whole propaganda of trying to ascribe it to one group or the other. And I think that we should stop from those things. It does not help anybody. It looks like it's a competition of who is worse than the other. When we know that the perpetrators are not around this table, and indeed, you know, we're political colors. So yes, we have the commitment to move forward. But when we're doing so, it must be professionally done and let all sides, in fact, both sides now and beyond, play their part. Security is a collective responsibility. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, just a follow up. Will you call for the immediate disbandment of these groups, these groups? these vigilante groups within political parties, because I do not think that they, that, that there is any, any part of our law that legitimizes these groups and their activities. Do you make a commitment that you get political leaders to disband all these groups within the political parties with immediate effect, if given the nod? Mr. Chairman, it will be, for me to be able to make such a recommendation or take such a decision, I must be convinced that those groups are responsible for these activities. And I've also said that there's no vicarious liability for criminal offenses. So I'm not aware that uh, it's political party vigilantes that are doing so. And let me give an experience. When I was, before I got into politics, I had a client from Ashama who came and told me she had constructed a filling station and that a chairman of a particular political party was always harassing him. And any time he got to report it to the police, he was ignored. So I asked him, how did he report it? He said, I always say that it's the chairman of a particular party. Do you know the name? He said, no. I said, go and find the name. When he got the name, I sent a junior lawyer of mine with him. He reported and the man was taken. What I want us to know is that let us you know, put the link offenses from partisan considerations. Ambrose has committed an offense, I'm Ambrose. I don't commit an offense as a member of the MPP because neither in the Constitution nor the manifesto does MPP provide for <laughs> wrongdoing. So when we begin to take them as individuals, it will be better. Otherwise, it comes back to the whole, uh, you know, uh, finger pointing. And then, sometimes I know it might be a matter of style. The way we handle things too, when we go and want to talk, discuss some things, and we, we are wearing red, it, it might well be sending signals wrongly. So whether vigilante or not, let us know that criminal liability is personal, and let people be responsible for their actions, and let us not give them the comfort of support. Otherwise, what we're going to do is undermine security and we have ourselves to blame. Chairman, um, uh, 
compelled to come with a follow-up to support the Honorable Ablaqua. We've had instances after political transitions of which both political parties in Ghana are guilty, NDC and PP, where individual members of the party will walk to a public office or public institution and say, close up, we are taking over from you. W will that belong to the category you just described? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No person should be able to move up to another and say, hand over to me. He should go and report to the relevant institutions that this is my complaint. However, like I talked about Article 41, it gives citizens the, the duty to protect public property. So if a citizen sees you destroying public property, it would be naive for him or her to leave you and go to the police station and come back. That's why we need to put everything in context. And the balance is very important. The important thing is that we should um, act within the law. Report when there's a wrong. Don't take the law into your own hands. And when it comes to that, let's consider the individuals as in their personal capacities. And let's forget what the political parties are behind them. Let me tell you something. In my constituency, there are some people who have all the political party T-shirts. So how are you determining that they are political party because they are in a T-shirt? That doesn't actually mean they might be. So I think we need to work together. But you have my commitment to ensure that wrongdoing is stopped. Thank you. Hey, Honorable Barbara. Thank you very much, Mr. Che. Congratulations, Honorable Amrit Jerry. My question is very simple. The issue of corruption has become a serious canker in our nation. I'd want to find out how you intend to fight corruption at the various agencies that will work under your ministry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The various agencies working under the Minister of Interior would be called upon to enforce the law strictly strictly no deviation if you make a wrong move you'll be sanctioned and once people know that that is it you would have better services they must work professionally so that's what i will insist on thank you and how do you coordinate the activities of the various agencies thank you mr chairman even now I, there are reports there are situational reports and they bring up. And of course, if you are aggrieved, you'd have to come forward and let me know what complaint you have. And I can assure you that I would, I would, I would follow up whatever complaints you have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Honorable uh, Neil Ante Van der Poy. Well, congratulations. Permit me to put our friendship aside and dwell on policy a little. My first question is, uh, can you critically analyze the various causes of conflicts in Ghana and what instruments you will be adopting and employing to prevent them, to prevent them and not address those conflict causes? Thank you very much. Causes of conflict, most of the time, are local. The cause of conflict in one location might be chieftaincy. In another location, might be economic. Even the honorable member will know that in some, it might even be soccer, football. So you need to understand them. The important thing is to resort more to alternative dispute resolution. If you go to the orthodox or traditional courts, there's always a winner and a loser. And dangers, the danger is that the winner might gloat and the victim might wait for another day. So if we resort to alternative dispute resolution and begin to use even local approaches to it, 
I believe that we would be making progress. So that is the way I intend to, to deal with it. Um, okay. I haven't finished. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, Honorable Ambrose Derry, migration has become a very critical issue, politically and economically, the world over. In Europe recently, it's an issue. Ghana has been hit by serious cases of migration, and which has led to Ghanaians being played out in the areas, for example, in mining industry, and also domestic trade. What measures will you be putting in place in order to make sure that we check the people who come into our country and also engage in these areas that, to some extent, the law preserves for Ghanaians. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Now, let's go back to the chorus that we enforce our laws. We do not enforce them. If some area is meant for Ghanaians, let us ensure it is. The immigration services obviously must be involved in how people get in, make sure they have the requisite documentation. If they don't, we should deal with them. But again, we all need to understand. For instance, if you talk about migration, it might also involve uh, others such as the Fulani issue. And there you might need, you know, best international practices. Yes, the law is the law. If there are offenses, they must be dealt with. But we might have to find ways, for instance, or maybe introducing intensive approaches to some of the cultural practices that we have. So, vigorously, we can do that. But the important thing is that the law must be enforced. And case by case basis, we have to enforce the law. That's what I always go back to. And last one has to be it flows from Honorable Yari Guest. The upsurge of slums and its attendant problems. What will your ministry be doing in reducing? the deprivation and the difficulties in the slum areas that lead to vulnerability and the problems that come with such. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's a multidisciplinary, multi-ministerial uh, 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 issue. And maybe it might make us understand why we have now a minister of uh, water and sanitation. Maybe all this, the, the, these are all areas that need to be given attention. I'm sure the honorable member whom I know, uh, I had my constituents in his area and involved in activities and I had to discuss with him. Maybe we need to do more of a hands-on approach to these things. And uh, I believe a minister to deal with that area might well come in handy. And so uh, we want to work together, but it's one ministry cannot deal with that. I will deal with the law enforcement part of it, but that is not sustainable we have to get other approaches and other ministries to come in to help. So thank you. Honorable, so, so I'll give you one, uh, what, uh, uh, one opportunity Barbara didn't use. I'll give it to you and then after that, Honorable Atacha, and then we come to leadership. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's very difficult because this is a very important area, internal security. And so I know, but um, there's several, so many issues. Because uh, I did want to ask about the status of the recruitment scandal, which happened a year ago. I also did want to ask about security for JB's murder, but then uh, after JB's murder, so I'm not sure how to go about. Chairman, we would raise an objection. 
the nominee is here. We are sitting as parliament. Any matter you have that you deem scandalous, tender the evidence and proceed on it. That should be the posture of this committee. On any question, particularly on the matter of a colleague, we would be interested for you to ask the nominee and to ask all security agencies to follow through letter spread in enforcing that that gruesome matter of our colleague never happened. So if you premise it with I don't want to, we want to. I did want to, but I don't know I how remember. I'm going to do it since I'm, I've been restricted I don't to asking one question. Can you question. please ask one of the questions? Other chair has taken note of the others. You continue for it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Then I'll ask the, the other one. Would you be prepared to reopen investigations into the Agboguloshi murders, Etiwa, and all other such cases in view of the fact that there is no statute of limitations in criminal matters, and also in the light of current happenings, so that we can stamp out the impunity which is creeping into our body politic and making it seem as if, depending on the political color you wear, you can get away literally with murder. And so no, no matter who I don't commits... Remember, um, I'm sure the Attorney General is next in line. So when it comes to reopening investigations, I'm sure she'll be here in a, in a few minutes. So if you ask another question, please. Okay, so let me shelve that for the Attorney General. Now, um, just last year, our colleague was murdered in his bed. And a lot of conversations were had about improving security for members of parliament and other public officials. So far, not much has happened. The situation still remains the same. There is a likelihood that without focusing on the security of those who have elected to serve their nation in various guises, the judiciary is offered security, the executive is offered security, the legislature are left to our own devices. Is the message being sent out there that our lives are not worth protecting, even though we're also the third arm, second arm of government, and we're working in tandem with all the other arms of government to provide um, a system of governance that we have chosen and to make it work? What would you do as Minister for Interior to ensure that members of parliament also are giving adequate security and to ensure that the investigation and prosecution of the, the perpetrators in this uh, gruesome murder of our, our, our co uh, colleague is properly followed through and that the informants who also provided the information that led to the arrest of the uh, perpetrators would also be adequately rewarded and protected and to give effect to proper witness protection. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I want to assure members here that even in the fifth parliament, we had that challenge that we're talking about. So personally, I'm very interested in getting uh, an arrangement in place, but I want to make it clear that it is not just for members of parliament, but even every citizen at large. But having said so, the special jobs that we have to do, leadership of parliament would have to take the necessary steps to appropriately uh, make an application for it to be considered. At, at a vetting, we cannot get that resolved. Then when it comes to the cases, I have my part, which is the investigatory one. The decision to prosecute or not is the Attorney General's. And when it's in process, it is the Attorney General. But Mr. Chairman, having worked there before, and Attorney General is my dear sister, we'll work together to see how we can take it. But I'll be happy to have leadership, and indeed the whole house make the appropriate approach, and I would advocate uh, that we have the necessary security while emphasizing that we also are interested in the security at large, lest they tell us we scratch each other's backs here at the expense of the rest of the citizenry. But I'm with you. Um, I'll do the follow-up myself. Um, 
are you suggesting that all citizens are exposed to the same risk as members of parliament? No, I haven't said so. I said in the special case, you know, but when I talk about that, it also benefits me. And I want to be sure that I'm doing it in the context of the national commitment. And that's what I'm saying, what I'm saying. So yes, we, it's a special matter. And like I said, in the fifth parliament, we were concerned about this. Even, I don't know how it has improved. We used to have people roaming around <laughs> in, in the prisons, and you could even get attacked in, in a washroom. So yes, I understand the problem. And there's a special case for parliamentarians. I agree. I'm, I'm glad you agree to that, because I think that in this country, we, we often succumb to this populist thing that because we elect the people, they are not la uh, entitled to some of the benefits or other. But certainly, if one MP loses his life, it costs the nation a lot of money to replace him. If we are considering that, some of these populism would, would go down. But if I were a magistrate, I would have a policeman. My, my colleagues here, your, your, your juniors who are at the high court, they have policemen sitting in their cars going back and forth. Uh, and, 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 and DCs have um, policemen. So we should make sure that the risk that we are exposed to, because we are doing things that uh, other people are not happy about, because we are uh, uh, refusing loans uh, and so on, we should be considered as a breed of people that require are exposed and, and therefore anyway. Mr. Mr. Chairman, let me give you my word that uh, I'm a converted. No need for preaching. I'm with you. Thank you. Honorable Attachan, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this opportunity. Honorable Ambrose Derry, I am very elated to see you here. I have no doubt in my mind that you fit the bill, and my prayers are with you. I ask a few questions, just two, for the purposes of time and the rest of it. Um, um, the um, whole area of police recruitment is a sensitive matter. And um, if somebody has a very, very shady background and is empowered by the state to protect us, the consequences will be there. We can't, we can't put our finger on it. So therefore, if you do not have a serious recruitment checks, background analysis, even with um, psychologists in tow, to see whether this man is fit to hold a gun, then we will be endangering the lives of Ghanaians. Um, what kind of arrangements do you have in mind to ensure that when we say this man has been recruited to come and protect, to go through the training and eventually come and protect us, uh, it's not a gamble. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I absolutely, totally agree with uh, Honorable Attorney on this matter. I think that we need to restructure the whole military, uh, recruitment exercise and ensure that we put in place background checks on people that we are recruiting. I mean, we hear several times that police officers are involved in robberies and uh, other offenses. And just as we are talking now, if we end up doing the right thing, giving each member of parliament uh, a bodyguard, he ends up being an armed robber. I mean, he might even find it easier to kill and, 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 and go scot free. So it's a serious area of concern, and we intend to streamline that. I need to, maybe we need some uh, ITT coming. Even, you know, there was a scandal recently. I've asked that the report of the investigation be made available so that we can learn from what happened then. But I agree that we need to do a more thorough uh, recruitment of our police people than we, we do now. There are even allegations that some people don't even go through the system, but they are taken. And if we continue to do so, we are all being endangering the lives of everybody. So I agree, we need to review and restructure the recruitment. This is my final question. Um, I think you have been a worshiper of the rule of law, and, and you've profited from it immensely. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me that the Bureau of National Investigations, with all respect, 
uh, is functioning sometimes uh, above the law. There have been very, very bad situations in which somebody has been arrested, and when they say he has a right to counsel, it entails the right of being alone. So that even if, um, I, I mean, I mean, he's done the wrong, you receive advice from counsel. But when it comes to BNI, unfortunately, they are gods unto themselves. And um, they will tell the lawyer to get out of the place. And the man is being interrogated, so probably they secure self confessions and the rest of it. What kind, how are you going to culture uh, these uh, individuals, the BNI, so that they respect the rule of law? Because you can use the rule of law also to achieve the same results. Yes. It's very important for our future. BNI should never be seen as above the law. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I agree with Honorable Atachi. I have experienced that myself several times. Then you go to BNI and they tell you, okay, okay, you, you go and come back. We must implement Article 17. We are equal before the law. But I will need to talk to my senior, Honorable uh, Kandapa, because that's an intelligence uh, agency. But the commitment to work within the law must be guaranteed. I've suffered it and I don't intend to condone that other lawyers suffered. In fact, the only place I disagree with my honorable learned friend is that we don't achieve the same results. In fact, when there's no lawyer, we achieve negative results. And we know that people have been convicted and served sentences, and after several years, people have come out to confess that they were framed up and what they, they, they convicted them or didn't exist. So I'll be one of the advocates to ensure that it happens. And BNI should not be above the law. I agree. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll come to leadership. Um, Honorable Deputy Majority Leader. Thank you. Honorable nominee and senior at the bar, congratulations. I have um, one or two questions for you. The first one has to do with our prisons. In the Western world, usually prisons are correctional units rather than punitive units. And so they focus more on reforming the behavior and attitudes of people rather than just dumping in there, them in there for them to suffer torture or um, cruel or inhumane treatment. Relating this to Article 14 of the Constitution, which guarantees every person, whether restricted, detained, or um, arrested, that right to be treated humanely. The Ghana Police Service is noted for sometimes taking the law into their own hands once you are brought in there. I want to have your take on it, relating it to the, the way we have to focus rather on correctional and instead of punitive. How do you, as a minister, if you're finally passed by the House, going to ensure that that constitutional right of every Ghanaian is guaranteed. And even if they are thrown in custody, they still would enjoy that right. And rather, met, um, correct behaviors rather than punish people. That's my first question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have spent a um, big chunk of my life fighting for the rights that you are talking about. And I'm not going to renege now that I'm where I am. It's quite frustrating that when we have assured people that they have rights to a fair trial, everything is done to make sure that they don't have it at all. And I'm going to deal with it. I believe that talking about the correctional aspect of uh, incarceration or prison, I believe that the bill that will bring would take care of that. But meanwhile, I am going to ensure that 
the police do not abuse those 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 proce those procedures, and uh, especially Article 14, it's been frustrating in the past. And now, what excuse do I have to hold this position and not make any attempts to make the law work in the way that we've all expected to do? So, Honourable Chairman, I am going to work very hard to ensure that abuses are reduced, and I'm open for reports of 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 allegations of abuse, and they will be pursued vigorously. Thank you. Um, my next question relates to the recruitment of women into the police. Um, in the NPP manifesto on page 148, we have said that we're actually going to push for more women to be recruited in the police service. This be, being the guiding framework of your operations, what are the major mechanisms that you're going to put in place to ensure that one, women are encouraged to enter the police, the police is made more attractive to women and not uh, traditionally a men's um, arena. And also, how are you going to sustain the, these mechanisms to ensure that it's a continuous process where women are allowed and given the opportunity to also serve in the police service. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm a believer in uh, parity. I believe the fifth parliament, when we, we ratified the African Charter on Election, Democracy, and Governance, Article 29 talked about parity in there. I don't know if we have domesticated it so far, but it is a promise that I'll be committed to. One way of looking at it, I in fact started discussing with a few people about the, the requirements, recruitment requirements, and which are the areas that pose challenges for women. In fact, I believe the two major subjects that you deal with will be English and maths. Uh, my take is that more women pass English than maths. And so, one way of doing it, if we find it to be an obstacle, would be to introduce those subjects in the training schools. Indeed, when it's not just that some schools are disadvantaged. And when people come from the rural areas and you take those grades per se, it'll be a problem. So what I'm saying is that we're going to look at the obstacles to working towards the parity and ensure that it happens because it is the right thing to do and we'll pursue it. I hope I have your support when we're working towards that. Thank you. Um, Honorable Ranking Member. Uh, Chairman, let me thank you once again for the opportunity and to congratulate my senior colleague, uh, the Honorable Ambrose uh, Derry, and to wish him well as Minister for Home Affairs. I trust that as Minister for Interior, responsible for home affairs. <laughs> and the Chairman, the Honorable Ambrose is a consummate advocate and adherent of fundamental rights and freedoms. And I'm particularly assured that he will do good to all manner of persons and enforce particularly the right that the Honorable uh, Atachia just referred to, that under Article 14, which you alluded to, there has been instances where the right to a fair trial, a fundamental right is disrespected. And for that matter, by extension, a disrespect to a constitutional provision. My would be to take you to pensions since I don't have my to doubt your competence there, the prison service have a difficulty with their pensions relative to other security agencies. And I'm also aware that even the Russian, they had requested for some executive intervention subject to fiscal space. What will you do to bring 
prisons to parity with their counterparts in the service on the specific matter of pensions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I agree that the conditions in prisons and maybe fire service and probably even immigration are not competitive. And it will be, it's important that we do make them competitive so that we can attract the right caliber of people into those services. Because if they are not competitive, then the basic material that you have to work with might not even be trainable. And whatever you do subsequently would not work. So I would uh, work for that. It's in consonance with what is in the uh, manifesto. But specifically, I would like to see know what the conditions are. As I said now, I don't know that. But I'm with you when we are found out that we should do something about that. And so I will work with you. I would also appeal that when I do come with the bills to Parliament to, to get them passed, to create the requisite legal framework that I will enjoy your support. So on that premise, I promise that I would live up to your expectation as a human rights, I, I, as a human rights lawyer. I not as a human rights lawyer, let me emphasize. He says he knows my credentials as that. And I say I will live up to his expectations as a human rights activist. So, Mr. Onabundapo is only in that narrow confine I'm talking. <laughs> Thank you. Chairman, as for Honorable Ambrose, he can call you Honorable Napo. No objection. If I did. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I hope that, I hope that the Honorable Ambrose is not suggesting that I learn to fit in the shoes of Oseiche when it comes to bills. I hear in the minority had a lot of time to, to scrutinize uh, bills. Chairman, that's just by the wayside. But the Chairman, I'm also aware that the nominee is a very proud son of the Upper West uh, region and shares his deprivations. And he's aware that his party since he's romantic about manifesto promises, talks about one dam, one village, and he appreciates that in the Upper West region, the development of the Kamba irrigation project, wouldn't it be superior to a one dam, one village something, honorable nominee? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I am passionate about one dam, one village, it is doable. And as the Honorable Kabo will tell you, under President Kufo, my village has already benefited from the one dam, one village encounter. So I believe that we will build on that. Uh, the Kamba, yes, the Kamba matter, you, that is a real big irrigation project. Indeed, my, my late father worked and retired as a regional manager of Irrigation Development Authority. That is something which needs to be studied and worked on. But for now, dugouts, as I have in my village and other villages, we would continue with that. But to go beyond that, we will need both sides to work for such a big uh, project, just like you have in Botanga, in Northern Region, and Via in, uh, in Upper West. I hope you will join us. In, 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 in lobbying for it, that. Even as it's not a manifesto commitment. <laughs> that, that is why I said we will do the one dam, one village, and not come back for now. Chairman, let me take him to the world of workman compensation. Uh, Chairman, coming from my recent past, I have seen instances where injured police officers or injured officers of the security agencies. I've had one sad experience of a stretch leg, one year on, no compensation. But Chairman, let me share this vivid uh, experience. There was an instance where one person could remove his eyeball on the table for me as Minister for Employment to demonstrate to me how dire his situation was, having suffered injury in the course of service to the state. Will you come with a reform package that within the service, 
after all, the police service generates some money. When we have these injuries, it can be compensated for and directly from your own pairs in order not to keep the affected persons crying and possibly dying. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I believe compensation issues would be part of the incentive package that uh, we promised the security agencies. And I believe subject to expediting the, pro the processes of working for those compensations. Sometimes it's just the bureaucracy that stalls most of these things. So yes, it's a thing that we would consider and as much as possible so that we can motivate the security men to give their best to the country. Chairman, uh, child labor and the growing development of it in our country is worrying some of our diplomatic uh, constituencies. Much of it has to do with some laxity of their borders, particularly involving the immigration service and the police service. Indeed, I'm aware that the U.S. government have formally expressed concern about it. Can you give us your word that you coordinate with, for instance, your Minister for Gender, the Attorney General? And you have a very unique experience, having been at the Attorney General office now in Interior, to be able to give better understanding of this word. Can we have your commitment to fighting child trafficking and matters relating to child labor? Thank you very much. Uh, as you know, that's part of the human rights uh, uh, concern. Yes, the Americans, the American embassy has got a problem with us. For the past two years, that was before 2016, Ghana has been rated as tier two. And if Ghana is rated as tier two a third year running, it will be downgraded to tier three, resulting in consequences that will make this country lose financially at least $650 million. The American embassy had written and asked for a response from the Minister of Interior latest 6th January 2017. As I sit now, no such response has been given. So I would have to work with the Attorney General, Minister for Gender, and also the last ministry that you were, because there are labor agencies and licensed actors in that sector who are giving us problems. So yes, it's a challenge, and we are going to try to do our best, because now that the response hasn't come from the Ministry of Interior, it has now fallen on us who have just come into power, and time is running out for us. So we do the best we can, and I hope that when we do appeal for certain interventions to be approved, it will be forthcoming. But I believe that some action will be taken. But so far, we've been failed because the response has not gone to the American by the Assad safe January. And as you know, we we're still waiting to be, to be uh, confirmed. Until we are confirmed, uh, designate my not have to cannot to go too far so but yes you have our commitment to do our best and we see what we are going to do with the other stakeholders thank so you uh, just a quick for i thought some ministers designate were already acting and you could also act referencing transitional act as government representative if you have a deadline of safe january you find that lawful or unlawful uh the transition, the argument has always been that His Excellency President Joe Mama was president until 7th. So I couldn't have acted before 7th. Now it's post 7th. And I can assure you yesterday I held a meeting with as the his president's representative. As the president's representative in that. And we are going to follow up. I hope you have no problem with that. <laughs> when the Attorney General Nomnik, Chairman, my final and last comment will be having walked through Parliament 
and the Ministry of Justice, and now Interior. Which aspects of the 1992 Constitution do you feel strongly about will require an agent or early review? I would rather say that I will keep this for another time because there are several uh, areas that uh, would, would require some fine tuning and uh, I'll wait and uh, appropriately approach it. Am I just one? <laughs> one, one, one area. One area of this constitution that uh, looking at this uh, operations, you may want to require, uh, or I should take you back. Chairman, um, uh, when we got to Article 88, you prefer some opinion. You want that to be a matter of record for this committee, that that's what you think about that provision? Yes, that's what I think about that provision. And you elaborate further. What do you want? Yeah. That there should be an independent uh, prosecutor uh, who would deal with the criminal uh, prosecutions independent of the attorney general, yes. What happens to the principal legal advisor to government? Would legal advice include advice on prosecution? No. Uh, the advice, when they say advisor, they ad it's advice per se. And you have the civil area because you are talking of contracts, you are talking of public interest. Yes, yes. So the prosecution need not be the advice. Indeed, what 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 is what is the advice to the government at that stage? You are supposed to to prosecute when you think that the law requires it. Who represents the state in matters of uh, prosecution and civil matters? As it stands now the Attorney General, when the necessary legal legislations have been put in place, no. Congratulations and thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, Honorable Majority Leader, I would like to ask you a question. Uh, I would have been very...